Good morning, guys. You guys, you got to sleep in. You can do better than that. Good morning, guys. Okay, that was much, much better. Good job, guys. Hey, um, thank you guys for coming to South Point Church this morning. We are so excited that you made it. Um, as you guys probably know, today's a holiday weekend, and unfortunately for you, that means that you get like the third string speaker, and so you're stuck with me today, but it's going to be fine, and I'll be quick, and we can go on about our days. Um, you guys, my name's Jen. I'm part of the team here at South Point, and we really are so excited that you joined us. Um, today's your first day, or if you've been coming for years, um, we just want to say thank you and welcome, whether you're here in the room with us, whether you're online, wherever you are in your walk, um, you are welcome here, and we are so excited that you made it. We are wrapping up our series. We are on week six of this series, Imperfect Parenting, What No One Tells Us. Does anybody wish that we would have gotten a parenting manual when we left the hospital? I sure did. That would would have been helpful, right? Um, If you've missed any of the previous week's messages, you can find them on YouTube or online. Um, They're all on there. This message um, will mostly stand by itself. Um, Today we're going to talk about um, an important part of parenting that um, I think we often miss, and I think as parents we often get it wrong. And before we jump in, I want you guys to know uh, my husband and I have four kids, They are 21, 18, 14, and 13. And I am not a perfect parent. I am a hot mess train wreck of a parent. And so if you feel conviction this week, just know that I had to sit in this a whole week. And all week long, I was like, God, I don't think I can talk about this because I got that wrong and that wrong and that wrong and that wrong. Um, But the great news is that, like, we all have room for improvement, right? Myself included. Um, So we're going to talk about today. We're going to put it up on the screen. And it is this right here. It's that connection isn't proximity. It's being truly seen and heard. Connection isn't about proximity. Um, I think sometimes we think um, I'm in the same room with my kids, and so we're connecting, but we're not. We're just doing our own thing. And um, what our kids need from us is they need to be seen and they need to be heard. So before we jump in, um, I feel like it's my goal to completely depress you guys and then bring you back up. Um, So we're going to talk about a couple of things that I think we as parents um, don't often realize and that we should just kind of bring to the forefront of our minds. Um, The first thing is this. 55% of kids and young adults report not having an adult in their life who truly shares their interests. That's 55%. So when you hear a percentage, if you're anything like me, you think 55%, that's half, that's one out of two. I can look around and go, that's you, not me, right? I got this. My my kids are fine. They feel seen and they feel heard. But the fact of the matter is that it's 55% of kids, not 55% of families. And if you have more than one kid and you can do the math, chances are someone in your family feels disconnected They feel like they're not seen and they're not heard. This uh, generation of kids and students coming up is the loneliest generation ever. That's not something I made up. Like statistics are showing this over and over again. They see everything happening online and what they see is everything that they're not doing. They only see what their friends are doing, what everyone else is doing, and they filter that through the lens of I'm alone and no one sees me. We, um, as parents, I think we have replaced connection with entertainment. And I am as guilty of this as anybody. Um, When our kids are old enough and we need them to occupy themselves, we give them an iPad and we say, here, watch YouTube. It'll just play on repeat. And they'll be quiet for a while. Um, But we forget that our kids need connection. They don't need entertainment. And as parents, it's not our job to entertain our kids 24 hours a day, right? But we do need to make genuine connection with them. Also, we need to recognize that our kids' needs change over their lifetime, right? When they're a newborn, we're physically responsible for keeping them alive. You can't leave them alone or unattended because they cannot keep themselves alive. So how we parent our six-year-old is very different from how we parent our 16-year-old. And so as parents, we need to be willing to change as our kids grow up and they go through different phases of life, we have to change our parenting style. I have a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old, and my kids are always in competition with each other. I don't know where they get that from, but we're just not going to talk about that. Um, 
My 14-year-old, I often hear, I don't want to do that because my brother doesn't have to do that. I'm like, well, your brother's 18 and the rules are different when you're 18. Well, no, we're all in the same family, so the rules are all the same. Well, no, you get to do things that your little brother doesn't get to do. And so as parents, we have to be able to adapt and change the rules and change the script as we go on. And so before we jump in, this is what I want everyone in the room to hear. Everybody needs someone to see them. Today's society, we are fast-paced, we are moving, we are doing all the things. And oftentimes our kids and our young adults and even our adults like ourselves, we look in the mirror and we go, man, I feel like no one sees me. Not just say, hey, how are you doing today? Because we all know we put on a smile and we go about our day, we're fine right? Everything's fine. It's always fine. But everyone needs someone who sees them. So as we kick this off, we're going to filter everything through two truths that I believe about everybody in this room, everybody that's online, everybody everywhere. We're going to put them up on the screen. And the first one is this. And it's every parent wants to be a better parent. As we think about parents, I know that every family situation is different. Um, Maybe you're not a birth parent. Maybe you're a foster parent or a grandparent. So we we use the word parent. What we're meaning is anyone who is directly responsible for influencing and raising any child between birth and 26 years old, right? It doesn't just stop when they're 18. So every parent wants to be a better parent. And I know some of you in this room, you're not parents, and you're thinking what you have to say doesn't apply to me. But it does because what we're going to talk about today can affect every area of our life, not just parenting. Maybe it's every spouse wants to be a better spouse. Maybe you think I'm not a spouse and I'm not a mom, so it doesn't really matter. But you all have relationships in your lives and you have friendship, and every friend wants to be a better friend. All right, so as we walk this out and we talk this out, just remember that I believe the best of every single person who is seeing this, that every parent and every spouse and every friend wants to be a better parent, a better spouse, and a better friend. Second thing we're going to talk about today is that every parent can do something more, right? Nobody's busy, are you? No, we don't have anything going on, right? Right? That's not true. And the last thing that I think that you guys want is you want to come to a church, a place that is supposed to give you hope. And we tell you, hey, you're doing it wrong. You've got to do more. Because is anybody in the audience tired? Right? We're doing all the things. You're working. You're paying bills. You're raising kids. You're being a spouse. You're being a friend. The list just goes on and on. And we just don't have any more to give. And so I want to turn that around a little bit today. And what I want to talk about today is that I'm not asking you to do more. I'm going to ask you to do different. Because I think every parent, while we probably can't do more, we can all do something different. And I believe that everyone here can and wants to do something different. And so as we're in church, you guys, I'm going to ask this question. I hope that you all know the answer. But who was really good at doing things differently? Jesus, good job, right? Obviously, I work with kids and students. We ask them baited questions all the time in church. The answer is always Jesus. Um, Jesus did things differently. And he did things not necessarily more, but differently. And so um, if you've grown up in church, you might know a lot of the Bible and you can repeat it verbatim when people talk things to you. Um, But the very beginning of the Bible is Genesis. And Genesis 1-1 tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. So God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. When we skip ahead to the New Testament, um, John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us, in the beginning the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. And so if we look at this through the lens of what we know today, when we see the term the word, we think what's the Bible, right? Because in church circles and stuff, we always talk about like, what does the word say? What does God say? What does the Bible have to say? Um, But if we skip ahead to John 1, 14, it says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So we know that the word is Jesus. The Hebrew scripture tells us it's an agent of creation, that Jesus was there in the beginning at the creation. And so I don't know about you, but I think that life in heaven is probably a little bit better 
than it is here on earth, right? It's definitely different. Um, but Jesus left the greatness of heaven to come do life here on earth with us. He made his dwelling among us. Jesus never loved from a distance. Jesus made it personal. He did things in personal connection with people. And when you read the New Testament, story after story reminds us that Jesus made it personal, right? He sat down at the well with the woman at the well. He washed the disciples' feet. He got in the boat with Peter. Jesus never ministered from afar. It was always up close and it was always personal. And so the story we're gonna talk about today is the story of Zacchaeus and about how a personal interaction with Jesus changed his life and changed the trajectory of his life and everyone around his life. So we're gonna jump in at... Luke 19, verses 1 through 4. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So here we are, there's crowds of people. Zacchaeus knows something is happening. He doesn't know what's happening. He just knows that something is coming. And tax collectors in this time, they're not the highest esteemed people, right? They're traitors, they're scammers. They are not doing the best things. But Zacchaeus knew there was a different way to do life. And he knew that he had to do differently because if he stood in the crowd, he would never be seen. So he climbed the tree and we're gonna pick it up in verse five. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down and welcomed him gladly. You guys, Jesus saw Zacchaeus. He entered into an actual relationship with him. And he showed him that he was interested in him, not just from a distance. He didn't just roll by and be like, hey, man in the tree, I see you up there. He saw him as a person, and he knew that he needed change in his life. And so I'll pick it up in verse seven. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. You see, Zacchaeus was just doing what he thought he should be doing. He was doing life the way he thought he should be doing life. But in that moment, being seen changed him. Being seen made him see that he had more value than what he was doing. Jesus stopped to spend time with a sinner. He stopped everything. There were parades of people. People were scrambling to see him and get his attention. And he said, you know what? Hold on. We got to talk to this guy. Okay, move on to verse nine. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus was living a lonely life, right? He wasn't just short. He probably didn't have a lot of friends. He probably didn't have a team of people that would help him through life and see things. But he was seen by Jesus. And the simple act of being seen was enough to change his life. He said, here, I'm going to give half of everything I own. And if I have wronged anyone, I'm going to pay them back fourfold. So he didn't just, Jesus seeing Zacchaeus didn't just impact Zacchaeus' life. It impacted the people that he gave to. It impacted the people that he had wronged, that he went above and beyond to. And it also impacted the community that was like, wait a second, Jesus, that, that guy's a sinner. You shouldn't be hanging out with him. And I think a lot of times um, our kids are a lot like Zacchaeus. They're just doing their own thing. All the time we hear, look at me, look at me. Listen to me, listen to me. Our kids are desperate for attention. I think we as parents have sometimes forgotten that like we need to see them and we need to connect with them and we need to meet them where they are because connection is being seen and heard. Next slide. Maybe, yeah. Connection is being seen and heard. 
And by Jesus seeing Zacchaeus, he changed it. Okay, so you guys, I'm really sorry, um, but this is the moment that I'm going to like offend everybody in the room and you're gonna be really sad and you're gonna be really angry and you're gonna have emotions flying, but it's gonna be okay because I've been sitting with these emotions for a while. All right, who all is busy, right? Does everybody feel busy? Does everybody feel like they can't do anything else, right? I got nothing left to give, I'm tired, I'm doing all the things that I know to do and it's still not enough. So when we started the scripture, we saw that Jesus was passing through Jericho, right? And we just read that and we think, oh yeah, he was going through a little town. But do you know what the town past Jericho is? It's just 25 kilometers further. It's Jerusalem. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, which means that Jesus was on his way to the cross and he was on his way to save humanity, right? He gets to Jerusalem, we know we've got the cross, we've got the crucifixion, we've got the resurrection. That's where Jesus was headed. And Jesus took the time to stop and see Zacchaeus. We fully expect that he was busy, that he had his crowd of people and everyone was gathering to see him and trying to slow him down. But Jesus said, hold on, there's somebody right there. There's somebody with value. There is someone that is important and we have to go see them. So I'm pretty sure if Jesus can stop on his way to save all of us, and see someone that we as parents and we as spouses and we as friends can take a few moments out of our day and see someone and make a connection, not just hang out with them from a distance, all right? So that was the worst part. You guys, you're doing great. Um, but what I wanna do, remember at the beginning we talked about, we're gonna do things differently. We're not gonna ask you to do more. And so up next, we're gonna talk about three rhythms in everybody's day that these are natural points that you can make connection with your kids, all right? I'm not gonna ask you to do more. I'm gonna ask you to take the time that you already have and maybe put your phones away, close the laptop, and make a connection with your kid. And we're gonna put them up here on the screen, and it's this. Meal time, drive time, and bedtime. Does anybody in here eat meals? My guess would be we all eat them, we all drive, and we all go to bed. And do you know what? Your kids do all of these things, three things also. All right? Um, meal time. This is super simple, and I know that I say things a lot that make me feel like I hate electronics. I don't. I love them. I spend way too much time on my phone. But if you're going to sit down and have, have dinner, get your whole family together and put your phones away. Right? And um, earlier this month, my daughter is 21, and she just finished up her junior year in Florida at college. And so I flew down and I picked her up and we were driving home and I was going, hey, can you tell me a little bit about like your feelings about coming home because you've been independent and doing your own thing for a year and now you're gonna move back home with all of us and that feels like it would be kind of hard. And she was like, well, the one thing that I'm most not looking forward to is having to put my phone away at dinner. So before you think, wow, Jen, you're nailing this parenting gig, let me just give you a little dose of reality. We don't have a cute little box in the middle of our table that everybody puts their phones in and we lock it. We tell everybody, put your phones away and they stick them in their pockets. And probably 452 times at every meal, one of my kids is going, <laughs> right? They're on their phones. But we try to make this time intentional and we try to use this time as a way to see each other. One thing that we do at mealtime, and if you have a highly competitive family, I don't encourage this. There are six of us, and someone always leaves the table in tears, but we play games at dinner time. I know you're thinking, wow, Jen, games isn't really connection, but what I've learned is that when I bring my whole family together to play a game, if someone gets upset sooner than normal, something is probably going on in their life that we should be aware of. And so it's like a gas gauge. Like I can gauge how everyone is doing by just their interactions with each other and how they're doing. So play a game. We often leave in tears. Someone is always mad. It's usually me because I hate losing. <laughs> Second time of day, you guys, is drive time. We all drive places, right? We all get in the car and we all take off. And if you have little kids, my guess is you buckle them in their car seats and you hit play on the DVD player. When they get a little bit older in elementary school, you might give them a tablet and they sit and do their own thing. They play games, right? Parents, I'm sure that when you guys get in the car, you buckle your phones out of reach so that you don't check anything while you're driving, right? We're just gonna believe the best about you today, right? It's, 
it's, it's a great time to connect with each other because you're all there together and you can get really mad at each other, but there's not really an exit ramp out of a car doing 60 miles an hour, right? Your kids are probably not gonna jump out of a car. Something I've learned that works well with my family is we have hard conversations in the car. When I know that they're having a really bad day or something in their world is not right, I'm like, hey, let, let's go get ice cream. Not because ice cream solves all of their problems, it does, but we're not supposed to say that. Um, because we're going to get in the car and we're going to drive there. And we're in the car. My attention is focused on the road. My eyes are ahead, but I can hear them. And I can hear their tone of voice. And it's a safe place for them to maybe say things to me they don't want to say. Or to maybe have awkward conversations that we're not super, super comfortable with. We can have those conversations in the car. And my kids have even turned this around on me a time or two. They're like, hey, let's go get ice cream. Just me and you. And I'm like... Oh, dang. <laughs> Buckle up, because I don't know what's coming, but it's probably not going to be great, right? We can talk on the way there. We can have ice cream, kind of open the conversation, let our guards down. And then on the way home, sometimes we don't go straight home. We have to circle a few blocks, and we've got to take some back roads and stuff, because it's a time where we can talk, and it's a time where kind of our guards are down, and it's a safe place to have these conversations. The last place is bedtime. I don't know about you guys, but when I go to bed, I lay down, it's dark, and I start processing through my day, what happened today? And I start kind of replaying all the conversations, the good and the bad, and I guess our kids do the same thing. And so when our kids are little, we lay in bed with them and we read them books and we say prayers and we get them ready for bed. But as they get older, we kind of stop that bedtime connection. And you guys, in a dark bedroom, your kids are in the bed, you can sit in bed with them or sit on the floor. That's a great opportunity to have a doorway into their life because they're replaying everything in their mind and it's dark so they can't see your face and you can't see their face which sometimes is what you need but it's a great time to actually connect with your kids right I think most times my home included it's bedtime I yell at my kids take a shower and I remind him the showers don't need to last an hour and then he goes to bed and I'm definitely doing the TikTok scroll of death because TikTok is my thing right I just want to sit and scroll. I don't want to do anything, anything more. But maybe what we need to be doing is something different, and we need to be building connections. It's the same with your spouse. You go to bed. Do you guys lay in bed and scroll on your phones with your backs to each other? Right? These are great opportunities to connect with other people. And so as we wrap up, I want to bring to your mind three truths that I think if we can keep these in the forefront of our minds, we can not only change our world and our kids' worlds, but we can actually ch impact the world for generations to come. And the first one is this. It's that connection is being seen and heard. When was the last time you sat and actually listened to your kids? My 14-year-old says this to me all the time. Can you just listen to me? You're not even listening to the words I'm saying. And you know what? He's right. I'm not, because I'm pushing my agenda. And I need to say what I need to say, and I'm very clearly communicating that what he needs to say is not as important as what I need to say. And every time he says that, it's like I can see him going, I have something to say, and nobody will listen. And so if we could just remember that connection is being seen and heard, because everything changes when it's somebody you know. Jesus changed Zacchaeus' life just by sitting down with him and listening to him. The second thing is this, make it personal. Every kid that you have is different. Every kid that you're going to have is different. Every kid that you come across is different. I have four kids and they have the same last name, but that's about the only thing that they have in common. Um, when my daughter was a kid, she loved Scooby-Doo, like all things Scooby-Doo. If Scooby-Doo was on, like she was in the zone, that was her thing. My older son, it was cars, it was Lightning McQueen, it was all things Lightning McQueen. He's 18, and today we still buy this kid Lightning McQueen presents at birthdays and at Christmas. But then number three came around, and he's 14 now, but he was once this little baby that was always into trouble. And he didn't have any interest in Scooby-Doo or Lightning McQueen or anything on the TV that might possibly hold his attention so that I could shower. But what I discovered one day as I was flipping through channels is the PGA Tour was on. 
You guys, he was one and a half, and that child sat there enamored. And I was like, what is going on? So I did what any good parent would do, and I hit the record button on the DVR. Because I knew that if I could put golf on, then my child, who got into anything and everything and could not be alone for even a moment, I could get a 10-minute shower, and he wasn't going to move. And so for about 18 months, we replayed this same tournament every single time I showered. So my youngest is 17 months younger than him, and I had to keep him alive, but I also needed to bathe. And so I would stick the baby in a little bouncy seat in the bathroom and I would put the PGA tour on, on my bed and he would sit there. But if I wasn't willing to see that every child is different, I would never have known that. So parenting, great tips from me, you guys. Put your kids in front of a TV. Um, But you have to make it personal. We have to make it personal with our kids. And the last thing, and this is the most important thing that I hope that you hear today, it's that everyone needs someone to see them like Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Our kids, our friends, our spouses, they all have potential that the world doesn't see. Zacchaeus had potential, but nobody saw it until Jesus came along. And so this is what I need you to know, is that everyone, not just everyone, like collectively including ourselves, me, you, we, we all need someone to see them like Jesus saw Zacchaeus. And in order to see someone, we have to sit down with them. We not only have to see them, but we have to close our mouths and close our fingers from being keyboard warriors. And we have to listen to them because everyone has potential just waiting to be discovered. At South Point, one of our core values is that life is better together, right? And we don't just say that so that we can all come in a room and count people and go, yay, we're winning. What we want is we want everyone to have a genuine connection with someone the way that Zacchaeus had a connection with Jesus. And so as we wrap this series up, you guys, there is no such thing as a perfect parent. So I know I heaped on a whole lot of guilt and shame and meanness to you, and I just need you to take all of that off because there is no such thing as a perfect parent. We are all imperfect parents. We are all imperfect spouses. We are all imperfect friends. But I think sometimes we kill ourselves trying to be perfect, trying to achieve a goal that doesn't exist, trying to achieve a goal that is only achieved if you're God and none of us are God. And so if you hear nothing else today, please hear this. There are millions of parents in the world. And you know what? God chose you to be the parent of your child. God knew what he was doing. So when you feel inadequate and you feel like you're not enough and you're not doing enough and everyone else on Facebook and Instagram are doing all the things with your kid, just remember that God didn't make you the parent of those kids and didn't make those parents the parents of your kids. He made you the parent of your kid because he knew what he was doing. He made you the spouse of your spouse and he put you in relationship with your friends because God knows what he was doing and there's no one better suited for the job than each and every person in this room and online watching this. Um, We're gonna pray. If you guys would get on your feet, we're gonna pray, we're gonna have worship and we're gonna get out of here. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just, um, we thank you for loving us despite of our brokenness. God, I thank you for each and every person in this room, each and every parent in this room who often feels like they're not doing enough, that it's never enough. God, um, your word tells us that we are enough because of who we are, not what we do. And so God, I pray for each and every person watching this, God, that they would see their worth, that they would see their value, God, and that they would embrace the imperfect parent that they are, God, that you have made them to be exactly who they are. Um, God, we thank you um, for everything that you've done for us. We pray for um, safety and amazing weeks to come. God, we love you so much. It's in your name we pray, amen.